Mr Crispin here once again and welcome to my workshop. Now today the hat's actually staying here because I'm about to go back inside. In making the slide bars part one I highlighted a few features and I pointed out that I wouldn't be machining them at this stage because I didn't have all the dimensions. Well following that a subscriber Dave Ticehurst contacted me and suggested that although I didn't have those dimensions perhaps I could calculate them based on some other key dimensions that I do have. Well I gave it some thought, I've done some sketches and I've come to the conclusion that I can work these out and if you've seen part two of making the slide bars you will be aware that I did work them out and I went ahead and machined those features. Now the purpose of this video is to both show you how I arrived at those features and also to give you a bit more of a general understanding of the cylinder block assembly and the design of this locomotive. Now what features am I talking about? Well, some of you may be familiar with this sketch. And the features I am referring to are these ones here in, um, in green. Both here and here. These features in the slide bars are not dimensioned on the drawings and they intercept another moving component within the valve gear so I've had to do a bit of thinking and a bit of calculation to work out where to put them and in this video you'll see how I did that. Now I also um, phoned a good friend of mine and steam locomotive expert Richard Gibbon and I ran my ideas past him and between us we agreed I could probably proceed with some confidence and I need to take this opportunity to formally apologise to Richard because at the moment I phoned him he was right in the middle of making a sticky toffee pudding and he had just got to the crucial bit where he had to boil something and then pour it on the pudding so apologies Richard I hope your dinner party guests weren't too put off by the fact you were having to discuss locomotive design and make the pudding. Now uh, luckily his wife was on hand she took the phone and explained Richard was a little stressed because although he's made lots of puddings to the Delia recipe he's moved to the Hollywood recipe and it was a bit of an experiment. She also commented that her and Richard had no idea how long it could take to make such a thing a sentiment with which I'm very familiar. So uh, that is what this video is going to be about Bear with me one moment. Right, I'm all set. I'm leaving for the drawing office. I am here at my kitchen table. It's a piece of late 1800s mahogany on four cabriole legs with casters. And this is where I do most of my uh, locomotive and video workings. Now, what I'm here to do today is to talk a bit about the slide bars and also give you a bit of uh, information on the cylinder assemblies while I'm at it. Now, I mentioned in my video on the slide bars that I was going to leave these features in green until later. And when I got the full assembly built, I would then work out where to put them. Now, I've actually change my mind. I want to try and put them in early, uh, in other words while I'm machining the slide bars so that I don't have to rework these later on. So once I finish machining these they're done and I don't have to start dismantling and remantling them as I go to add more machining. Now uh, what do these features actually do? Well in this slide bar as I mentioned in the video runs a component called the crosshead. So this runs up and down supporting the end of the piston rod and the idea here is that in a properly set up mechanism the crosshead overruns here and overruns here in terms of length of travel such that the front face and the rear face of the crosshead slide are in clear fresh air. So clear fresh air at both sides and I mentioned this had a dirt trapping effect so say you had some dirt on the slide the crosshead would let it run off and it would push the dirt down into the slot. I think that's partly true but I've also learned the main purpose of this feature is the prevention of a wear ridge. Now if you imagine this crosshead running up and down let's say to here and here then as that's running there all day the wear is only happening within that segment and you form where my pencil mark is a wear ridge. 
Now by altering this stroke length such that it runs into clear fresh air that wear ridge doesn't form and uh, is a, uh, a more robust solution when considering the, the long term life of these things. So prevention of the wear ridge and potential dirt trapping is the purpose of these and the reason I was going to leave them out is as I said I didn't quite know exactly where this crosshead was going to end up because there's no dimensions for that. So what I'm going to be doing in this video is going through some of the drawings and doing some sketches and working out exactly where these faces are such that I can machine them in before I've even got the cylinders fully assembled. So that is the plan. Now let's kick off with a bit of real life. So some of you will be familiar with my cylinder blocks and pistons. I uh, assembled all this in a fairly recent video and some of you if you cast your minds back will also be familiar with the cylinder covers I made. Now these cylinder covers slide down the front here and fit into the bore. Equally I have a rear cover which fits on the back and uh, they obviously form the ends of the cylinder. Now on the front cover mounts the slide bar. This mounts on top of the front cover. Uh, forgive me if I'm mixing up front and rear. Uh, this is actually the front of the locomotive so in theory this is the, the front cover. I'll call them left and right for now. So on the right hand cover mounts the slide bar and on the end of the piston rod goes the crosshead and as that piston goes in and out the crosshead runs within the slide bar rail and provides support both for the end of the piston and for the pivoting motion of the connecting rod which is happening about the circle I have drawn on there. So that's the real life uh, example and what this is all about is working in relation to the end of the slide bar. What are my positions for the running front and back, left and right? <coughs> Now the question may have already occurred in your mind, why on earth am I doing this on a piece of paper and not on CAD? I could just draw the assembly in its both uh, front and back positions and then take some measurements. And there's no, not really a good answer for why I'm not doing this on CAD, apart from that it's quite handy to develop these uh, drawing and thinking skills because it means that when you're in a meeting or a manager's presentation or... A briefing you can look like you're taking notes while actually doing calculations for the locomotive so uh, that's about the only answer I can give. I'm going to start by drawing a few things out so uh, excuse a slight change of plan here I started drawing that in pencil and I decided you couldn't see anything so um, let's try again. So what I'm drawing here is the side walls of the ball So on the front of these cylinders, or the right of the cylinder, goes the cap that supports the slide bar. And very important to note that this cap actually sticks into the bore very slightly. And now that I've got that, I'm going to draw the piston at both ends of its travel. Okay that's the basic components outlined and I've just drawn a little datum in there in line with this front face. That is because as I do all these calculations I'm going to make them all relevant to that datum because when I go back to the workshop that is what I'm actually going to be measuring off to machine these features in. So when I find out where my uh, cuts need to be. I'm going to be doing them in relation to this end so because of that all my dimensions are going to be calculated from that face to make the machining fairly straightforward. So now that I've got that I'm going to put some dimensions to this. Now first of all what's the overall length of the bore? Well the actual block is 3.375 3 and 3 eighths although I have a 1 16th step coming into the bore and therefore consuming part of the bore on each end. So if that's three and three eighths 
goes down a sixteenth and a sixteenth to three and two eighths, three and a quarter. So my free bore space, I'll write this out, is um, 3.250. Okay, um, so that's fine. Next up, I want to know um, about the travel of these pistons. I'm referring to a picture. I will point out that the stroke length is going to be basically defined by the crank. So the crank on this locomotive is about the centre driving wheel. It pivots around the centre of the wheel and the radius is the distance from the wheel centre to the crank pin centre. And obviously as that rotates it describes a circle, the diameter of which will equal the stroke length. So on the uh, scaled down version that crank radius is um, one and one eighth. Therefore, the stroke length will be two and a quarter. So I've got three and a quarter free space in the bore and a stroke length of two and a quarter. So if I draw that in, what I've actually got there, I've got a stroke length of two and a quarter. But the space consumed within the bore for that stroke length is actually the stroke length plus the width of the piston. And the piston happens to be 7 eighths of an inch, 0 0.875, meaning that the total space consumed within the bore is 3 and an eighth. Okay, so to define exactly uh, what space I've got at either end, I'm first of all going to assume that I will be setting that 3.125 um, centrally about the available bore length. So in other words, the gap of the piston when it's fully forward will match the gap of the piston when it's fully back. And if I do that, obviously I've got an available 3 and a quarter. I'm using 3 and an eighth, so that leaves me an eighth. So that means that at each end I have a gap of a sixteenth. We'll call it 62 thou. So I'm starting to get some dimensions here that I can work with now. Um, next up, let's draw the slide bar in itself. This is going to be down here. Just draw one layer of the sandwich. Um, so there's the slide bar and everything is coming from this face which means that I need to oops, I need to give the dimension of this which happens to be a quarter of an inch. And the reason that's important is because I'm starting to build these dimensions forwards. I've got the piston and cylinder relationship set and I'm now adding on to this the relation from that to the front which happens to be the datum and I'm going to now continue to work forward to where I get to my dimensions. Now the final thing to do going forward is to give the dimension from the piston face to the face of the rod here and I believe that is four and five sixteenths so we've got four point three one two I'll call it so as a quick recap I've established the cylinder block and pistons relationship I've then worked forward from that to include the width of the cylinder cover and I've also worked from the piston to the end of the rod and this gives me most pretty much all of the longitudinal dimensions I need to calculate where exactly this cross head is going to end up. Now the first thing I want to know is with the piston at its forward position where is the end of the rod back to the datum? Well I've got all the dimensions to work this out. I've got a distance of four 
and 5 sixteenths from the piston face to the end of the rod and I'm just going to start minusing everything that's in front of it. Now if we look at the minusing here I've got a sixteenth plus a quarter well there's four sixteenths in a quarter that means five sixteenths so four and five sixteenths minus four and five sixteenths is four inches so from my datum uh, I'll put it down here to the front of the rod at its forward position is four inches right on so all I have to do from there is add on the dimensions of the crosshead to give me that working position. Now uh, the crosshead drawings are a topic for another day but basically from this end here sorry from this end here to the front of my uh, workings is a distance of 1.125 inches so in case, in case I didn't make that clear Imagine the crosshead on the end, the dimension from the end of the piston rod out beyond the centre of the bore to its final extension is an extra 1.125, meaning that that end working position from the datum is a dimension of 5. 0.125 <coughs> so I, I expect about three people are still watching but for the three of you that are hopefully you are following this uh, 5.125 that's the full extent forwards now to get to the full extent backwards uh, I could do the same calculation again from the piston face but all I actually need to do is just do a bit of reconsidering uh, the stroke length was 2.5250, two and a quarter. So when the stroke is at its other position, this will have moved back from there to there, 2.250. So if I add to the stroke length, the length of the crosshead, that will give me my rear working position. And that will be, let's say here, so I've got the stroke length uh, 2.250 plus the length of the crosshead which happens to be one and a quarter 1.250 and we had 2.250 so my uh, retraction distance is, is 3 inches Sorry, three and a half inches. <coughs> I wondered how long it would take you all to spot that. Now, um, that is my main extents. So, in its full working position, the crosshead should come to there. And in its rear working position, the crosshead should come to there. Um, now, that's not actually the full picture because, as I said, I need the crosshead to overrun and overrun. So, Producing the step right on the extent is of no use. I need to pull the machining further this way. And I'm going to do that by 25 thou, just over half a millimetre on both sides. So I'm going to adjust this dimension to become slightly inboard. I'm going to take it from 5.125 to 5.10. Draw a red box around that so I know what I'm doing. And on this side, first of all, I need to take the 5.125 less the retraction length, which comes out at 1.625. And 1.625, this time I'm going this way with my undercut, an extra 25 thou. That means that this dimension from the datum comes out at 1.650. Oh. 
Now again, in case that was unclear, let me say that once more. So to calculate this position, I've taken the forward position, I've minus the retraction length, 3.5, and I have then added 25 thou to push the undercut forward of the crossheads position, meaning that at both sides it's running into clear fresh air. So that is my two numbers. I have no idea if this format of explanation is at all clear. It's a bit of an experiment, so do let me know. Other than that, I'm done, so I shall return to the workshop for a conclusion, and then I shall leave you in peace. Well, there we are, all done. Now, whether the little ins and outs of that all made sense doesn't matter too much. Um, hopefully the overall theme made sense of how all the bits go together. Cylinder blocks, pistons, rods, cylinder covers, slide bars, cross heads, etc. And hopefully you can see how I arrived at those numbers that I uh, then machined the part to. Now you can see how something like that uh, would have been a lot more if effectively done on a CAD package. You could have drawn the cylinder block, drawn the piston, and uh, rod and crosshead assembly in one extreme position then moved it to the other extreme position and just taken all your measurements from there i do tend to enjoy doing the odd little sketch and i'm naturally drawn to doing it that way perhaps in my genes because we have had in the past and still do have now quite a few artists in the family and uh, sorry no no not not that kind of artist no it, um in fact they don't drink alcohol at all Yes, anyway, so uh, yes, perhaps a CAD package is the way to go. Moving on from here, I am going to take these finished slide bars and I am going to fit them to the cylinder blocks. So that will involve fitting the cylinder covers to the cylinder, fitting the slide bar to the cylinder cover, etc. That will be up next. Until then, I hope you found this interesting. Thank you for watching and see you on the next video.